What impact will Benjamin Netanyahu's removal from office and the installation of a new Israeli government have on Palestinian efforts to generate international support? How can the PLO reclaim its role as the undisputed representative of Palestinians everywhere? Welcome to Connections, the Arab Studies Institute interview program on current events, policy questions, and new ideas. I'm Mu'ain Rabbani, and for this episode, we're delighted to be speaking with Hanan Ashrawi, widely recognized as one of the most articulate and eloquent Palestinian public figures. Dr. Hanan Ashrawi, formerly chair of the Department of English, English Literature rather, at Birzeit University, became a household name as the official spokesperson of the Palestinian delegation to the 1991 Middle East Madrid Peace Conference. In that capacity, she routinely sparred with the Israeli spokesperson, Benjamin Netanyahu, and typically got the better of him. In 1996, she was elected to the Palestinian Legislative Council representing Jerusalem, and that same year was appointed the Palestinian Authority's Minister of Higher Education. Re-elected to Parliament in 2006, Hanan Ashrawi in 2009 became the first woman to serve on the PLO Executive Committee remaining a member until her resignation last year. She was also a founder of the Palestinian Independent Commission for Human Rights in 1994 and served as its first commissioner general. She is currently the executive director of Miftah, the Palestinian Initiative for the Promotion of Global Dialogue and Democracy. Dr. Ashrawi, it's a real pleasure to have you on the program. I believe you might be muted. I am. Okay. <laughs> yes, I am. Thank great. you. Thank yeah. you. No, I said thank you, Maureen, for your introduction, and it's great to be with you again. Thank you. You know, since we arranged this interview, there have been some important developments, um, and I, I would like to suggest we start with those. Um, this past week has seen the horrific killing of uh, Nizar Banat, a critic of the Palestinian Authority, by PA security forces, and shocking images yesterday, for example, of plainclothes thugs attacking peaceful demonstrators on the streets of Ramallah and elsewhere. I've spoken with people in Palestine who believe this latest incident may well have irretrievably demolished the legitimacy of not only the current leadership, but also the PA itself, particularly among those who were previously agnostic on this issue. What are your views of this assessment um, of the state of Palestinian politics more generally? And how, in your view, should Palestinians mobilize to meet the challenges confronting them at this moment? Yeah. Well, what happened recently, I mean, the, the killing, the uh, violent uh, arrest and, and uh, the killing of uh, Nizar Banat did not happen in isolation. Actually, it came in a, con a context of an ongoing deterioration in conditions on the ground, internally within Palestine, particularly issues having to do with fundamental rights and freedoms, with the issues of good governance, democracy, uh, respect for um, uh, the, the individuals, citizens, and so on, and a concept actually of uh, participatory governance and, and uh, inclusive democracy. Uh, so uh, this is one thing. We, we've been witnessing this deterioration and we've been cautioning and we've been warning against uh, pursuing this path, which in itself can lead to disastrous effects, which is what's happening. But before that, we saw how uh, under a lot of pressure and demands to have elections in order to rejuvenate the Palestinian political system, to reform the system, to re-legitimize our institutions and the political system. There was an agreement and the, the president issued a decree that there will be elections. And then as a result of several factors, but the main factor was the fact that uh, Fatah was uh, uh, splintering in, in many ways and could not guarantee a full majority. And uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, Israel would not allow uh, elections in Jerusalem, that was an excuse that can be picked up because there were two uh, schools of thought, those who felt seriously that the issue of Jerusalem is a matter of resistance and confrontation. 
that we cannot ask permission from Israel to have elections and then sit back and wait. No, we will have elections. We had elections before. We did have confrontations. I personally was stopped and beaten up and detained and so on, even though I was running for Jerusalem in Jerusalem. So it's never been easy and it's never been normal. And we knew any elections in Jerusalem and anywhere uh, are going to be faced with obstacles, with checkpoints, with uh, uh, refusal to, to allow others, with intimidation and so on. So that was uh, another issue. That led to a sense of tremendous letdown among people who were so excited about elections, frankly speaking, regardless of their, their feelings on, on the uh, system and uh, so on. We had 36 uh, electoral lists, uh, 389 candidates. Much uh, higher than in previous elections, I believe. Of course, and, and yeah. yes, and 104 women, and the average age is, was much younger. So it's the young people who felt that this is their day, that this is how they can engage to make a difference, to carry out this transformation, this change, to make their agenda and their voice and their energy felt, and to be part of the, the uh, uh, agency uh, in order to uh, change and reform. Now with the cancellation, there was again a sense of letdown and that also led to greater resentment against the leadership. Uh, and this resentment of course has been happening over a long period. Uh, we saw how, for example, rule by decree became the norm, how uh, the judiciary was targeted by uh, decrees that made the judiciary dependent on the executive and, and mainly the presidential will. We saw how civil society was being targeted we saw how people were being detained and, and threatened and so on for their uh, opinions. We saw the, the uh, cyber crimes law being implemented. All sorts of things that came together, came to a head, and the letdown came when, uh, uh, not the let, things blew up, let's say, when Nizar uh, Benat was uh, killed. If I may, I mean, you, you seem to be confirming what I've been hearing elsewhere, that as outraged as, as people undoubtedly were about the killing of Nizar Banat, it was also very much a collective feeling that this is the last straw in yeah. view of the issues you've been discussing, um, the whole issue about the exchange of expiring vaccines for new ones um, uh, with Israel. That, yeah, the feeling that's that the, the Gaza yeah. attacks on Gaza. Yeah. The feeling and that the, the leadership that the, was absent during that Yeah, time. the leadership was seen as being irrelevant or incapable of handling uh, matters and issues. Economic conditions are also deteriorating, but there are all sorts of factors. The, the, the assault on Jerusalem, particularly on Sheikh Jarrah, on uh, Silwan, on the old city, on Al-Aqsa Mosque, uh, Damascus Gate, but throughout uh, the Jerusalem area, and now there are assaults actually everywhere. We uh, look at uh, Beta, look at different other places. Uh, Israel is escalating and the people are taking matters into their own hands. And, and, and Beta, they are daily. And, and so they're beginning to feel that they have to lead and not yeah. the officials who yeah. are supposed to be the leaders. And this came to a head when you saw the uh, collective unified position of Palestinians everywhere. Mm -hmm. Whether in the West During Bank, during the past in month, yeah, or in in 48 Palestine, yeah. uh, Palestinians in exile and and in refugee camps and so on, that meant that regardless of what happens, the specificity of your own of the injustice under which you live, that you are one people, you share the same vision, you share the same objectives, and you can act together and move together. This was Which, very empowering and very important to people. But it's also something that I think has, has been largely absent for most Palestinians for a very long time, which brings yeah. me to, to my next question. Um, do you agree with the assessment that this could well be a defining moment for Palestinians in terms of their engagement with their own political system and national movement? And if so, what's next in your view? Yeah, I think it is a defining moment in many ways. It sent a message to everybody. First of all, the message of unity we were talking about. 
that regardless of where we are, all attempts at our uh, fragmentation, dislocation, uh, dispersal, and so on, have failed. Mm -hmm. And for decades, people have been trying to deal with us, either as population centers or as people in one open air prison or as people living under tremendous uh, discriminatory systems or people uh, in exile uh, prevented from returning and so on. People felt that we got, uh, or the word, that we got used to this type of fragmented victimization and, and different types of oppression. And we were dealing each one within our own system. We dealt with- Dealing with the local problems, so to yes, speak. Yes, settlements and so on, our problem. Uh, control over uh, movement and so on. Gaza under siege, Jerusalem being totally besieged and transformed and ethnic cleansing uh, undertaken uh, constantly. Palestinians of 48 under a brutal discriminatory apartheid system. So, and the exiles unable to return. So people felt, okay, so you have your own problems, deal with them uh, in some ways, but do not come up with a collectivity with a unified voice. What and that's we, exactly what people have done in the past several weeks and months. Yeah, is that we came up together. I mean, something happened in Jerusalem. The people of 48 came in their buses to, to come to Al-Aqsa, to the old city. The Israelis stopped the buses. They got off the buses and started walking by the hundreds, by the thousands. So the people, the Palestinians of Jerusalem went out in their cars and so on to pick them up. There was a sense of spontaneous uh, uh, complementarity, so to speak, and working together uh, as a unified whole. The same thing in, in Gaza, the same thing uh, uh, outside, where with this new network and with the uh, uh, social media and with the ability to formulate positions and, and to gain access to the truth and to facts, as well as getting access to solidarity groups everywhere. This empowered the Palestinians. So that was one thing that surprised everybody. Two, the generational issue. Everybody felt that this generation has been, uh, I don't want to say tamed, but suppressed, that they're not going to be involved in politics. You're talking about the, uh, huh? You're talking about the younger generation. The younger generation that the older generation has been you know, set in place, they have their own ways, that they are not going to rock the boat, that they have their own interests and so on. And they were taken for granted and their modus operandi. Was, I mean, the whole thing, the whole system was ossified, was totally uh, uh, you know, calcified. <laughs> it was incapable of coping with realities. I was clearly seen as being incapable of coping. So people felt, and the world said, okay, this younger generation, all they want to do is have a good life, mm -hmm. send their kids to school, have an income, and so on. This is the source of the sort of economic peace concept, uh, the bribery, a handout, a few dollars, and they will accept their oppression. And so they ended up seeing a spirit and uh, an energy and a focus and an articulation of the Palestinian case that takes us to the third important issue, which is the fact that they took matters back to the basics. It's no longer just 1967. It's no longer self-rule, self-government, et cetera. It is now the whole concept of the settler colonial regime in Israel, the whole concept of uh, uh, displacement replacement, as the land paper says, the, the, this paradigm that seeks to uh, erase a whole people uh, and take over and appropriate their culture, their land, and uh, create a forgery you know, of the realities. The issue of the refugees, the issue of the fact that the Palestinians are unified, but not only on the concept of two states or a statelet or self-rule or whatever, but unified on a redefinition of the Palestinian issue. This is very important. So here you have the unity, you have the younger generation, you have a new uh, image, a new uh, uh, focus, you have a message coming out, and the message goes back to basics. The thing that Israel had tried to eradicate all these years by saying, no, no, the, the thing is, you know, the, the West Bank and, and Gaza and Gaza is full of terrorists and the West Bank can be fragmented and settlements can 
you know, turn the West Bank into a series of population centers and that's it. So it's a new reality. And that gave people hope. Now, in that overall context, you also have internally a buildup of a sense of frustration and anger uh, that we deserve better and we can do better. Now, the negative side, of course, is that there's tremendous suffering. And Israel, of course, is targeting all these different components in a variety of ways relentlessly. And then we can talk about the international community and the US and the EU, if you will. But, but before doing so, um, you used the term uh, spontaneous or spontaneity to, to refer to the present mobilization. Now, one aspect of spontaneity is that it tends to be quite widespread. But another one is that it can prove to be transient and, and yeah. ephemeral. So if we look forward, um, do you see indications that people are working to establish an organizational infrastructure yeah. to, to sustain their campaigns. How do you see, um, uh, you know, and, and, and we haven't even touched on the subject also of the Palestinian schism, which has been ongoing since 2006, 2007. So I'm curious, you know, given your long-term involvement in, in the national movement, um, in both the Palestinian Authority and the PLO, how you see things developing in the coming period? Okay, the first issue of uh, spontaneity, in a sense, being a source of uh, being ephemeral and the temporary change or transformation. But anyway, uh, be, it is spontaneous, but it is built on and based on um, an ongoing uh, awareness, a build-up, as we said. That, that led to this uh, no, no, no. expression, <laughs> revolt, rebellion, whatever you want. But there, there have been movements. Look, when people were preparing for elections and when they formed their 36 electoral lists, these lists were formed on the basis of political agendas, on the basis of agreed uh, programs and visions. Mm -hmm. And they decided to run in order to change precisely. So you already have the basis of an infrastructure. They may not be political parties. They may not have the legitimacy of having been elected, but at least they have the recognition of having organized and formed themselves and, and put together their lists and their agendas and so on to run, to be part of the political system. That's one. Two, the civil society that is extremely active and aware. And civil society is very much in touch with uh, uh, these uh, younger organizations and so on. There are women's groups, there are youth groups that have been working for some time. And I think the, the experience the subject of the Arab Spring and the fact that mobilization and cyberspace and so on is great and you can bring down a system, but if you are not ready to take over, you won't be able to, to change. So that's people, a crucial question, I think. Are, are people ready to take over? That's it. People want to. People want to be, as I said, instruments of change and part of this change. And people know that the, the system, our system, uh, is, is incapable of generating reform from within anymore. And I've seen it. I've, I've been you know, in the PLO for several years, as you know, and before that uh, I was a minister and, and I was in the PLC all these years. And all my political life, I've been working to affect change and reform and transformation and democracy. All the institutions I set up in civil society, whether it's the Independent Commission for Human Rights or uh, Miftah or Aman, the, the uh, Coalition for Accountability and, and Integrity, all these are uh, guarantees, again, that civil society can exercise its role, not just in oversight, but in formulating the agenda and then carrying out reforms. So when you, you have... If I can interrupt you, you've nevertheless, uh, if I understood you correctly, reached the conclusion that reform from within is no longer an option, which yeah. means that there has to be transformation from without, presumably. Exactly, exactly. The system is, is so set in its ways and so closed in and the space has shrunk so much for participatory decision-making 
and for democracy and for separation of powers and for respect for our institutions. One of our major problems is the constant weakening and marginalization of the PLO itself and its institutions, as well as the exclusion of women and youth. And, and I said these things openly when I resigned. It wasn't easy to resign, by the way. Uh, this is your resignation I, from the PLO Executive Committee last yeah. year. Yeah. yeah, it's very difficult because you face a lot of opposition and then a smear campaign and so on. For years, I've, I've been trying to resign, think, knowing that you know my work at trying to carry out this transformation or change from the within or reform from within is, it's just being used as a front. So you be, end up becoming a cover for decisions you're not part of even. <laughs> and the institution has not been respected as the PLO. And, and I knew the importance of the PLO. This is one reason I, expect, I accepted to run for, for mm -hmm. office in the PLO. But when you weaken the one system that is supposed to represent Palestinians everywhere, that is supposed to be the, the inclusive democracy of Palestinians wherever they are scattered and so on. When you weaken the sense of representation hmm, and empowerment, then what do you have left? You have just a set, a series of uh, service delivery institutions and offices. And this is exactly what Israel and in many cases the West wanted, the functional mm -hmm. approach. It's like the, uh, the Oslo agreements. We had a long discussion, you and I, about how they adopted the functional approach. Mm -hmm. They want us to be, you know, to administer the occupation instead of the territorial approach, instead of the right to self-determination, instead of the national approach, which the PLO represents. They set up the PA. Mm -hmm. So it can become a series of service delivery institutions, the functional administrative approach without any political horizons. And this is where we ended. So uh, trying to change is not easy. And many people now uh, saw that, that just being part of the system is maybe giving it more life, maybe credibility. I don't know. <laughs> but I certainly didn't want to be a token. And it was very hard to leave. I can tell you it's not easy because the system defends itself. And especially if they see a woman or somebody who says, I can walk away and I want to walk away you become a threat. But still, there are many young people now who are ready for change and who are ready to take over now, how far they can go in their organizational uh, capacity. And in their, if there are no elections, it's going to be very difficult. You need to have elections. Now, uh, I, I'll say the last thing here is that we have this rift you mentioned. Yes, we have Hamas in Gaza, and it's certainly not a democratic system. And to many people, it's ironic that they're talking about rights and freedoms and right to, to dissent and to demonstrate and to protest when people don't have it in Gaza. And you have here Fatah and its few uh, factions <laughs> that are working together. And instead of you know, coming together to see how they can serve the national cause, they're both fragmenting the national cause and put each pushing and pulling in its own way because of privilege and entitlement and, and so on for both sides. So in between, well, there are these people who said, maybe a pox on both their houses. Maybe that's not what we need, <laughs> maybe the, the whole language, the whole, the sloganeering, the cliches, the same old approach does not work anymore. And it is incapable of coping with uh, transformational realities throughout the world, not just in Palestine. The young people know what's happening and they need a new language and they need to feel that they are empowered and that they can enact that vision and, and that they will have support. So that, that's what gives me hope, but I think alone, it's going to be difficult. And what we saw these days when there was this mobilization to attack, uh, to use uh, violence against the young men and women, to start this, camp this smear campaign against them, that they are, uh, this is a, a Hamas attempt at uh, a coup d'etat or- uh, Serving foreign agendas and so Working on. for an agenda, suspicious people. They're, yes, they have external connections and so on. So this, uh, that, and then trying to mobilize Fatih against them, this is not fair. Because I wrote, this is not 
Fatah. I mean, the security forces have been indoctrinated in many ways. Don't use Fatah against the other Palestinian people because that would create another rift. Huh? And there are many people from Fatah who are writing some reasonable uh, and assessments and, and the critical analysis of what's happening. So unless they listen, unless they understand that, as you said, this is a turning point, this is a critical period, uh, they cannot sustain themselves. They cannot afford to go on unless they continue crushing and oppressing any opposition. And this is going to lead to even further disgruntlement and, and uh, instability. The, the coming days and weeks uh, will tell, I think, just yeah. how defining of a moment this is going to be. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned um, uh, the role of the West, and mm -hmm. I'd, I'd now like to turn to that. Um, let's say not the usual suspects in terms of, <laughs> of, of Washington, but perhaps to focus more specifically on the role of Europe, which many people see as kind of the counterbalance to the uncritical, unconditional support for Israel emanating out of Washington. And, and the reason I raise this is because one issue that you have written about quite a lot is the double standards and selective morality that the yeah. Europeans seem to have um, turned into a high art form. Um, yeah, I, on, on your Twitter account, you were recently commenting on yet another EU examination of the Palestinian curriculum. Um, you now have uh, European states and institutions um, adopting um, definitions of anti-Semitism that seem to be more about suppressing critical criticism of Israel than having anything to do with, with anti-Semitism as conventionally understood. And I was wondering whether, whether you might comment um, uh, yeah. for those who are perhaps unfamiliar with your views on this issue, what, what, what the core yeah. points are that you've been trying to convey. <laughs> well, I'm desperately trying to find some positive things to say. <laughs> <laughs> Look, because years ago, I mean, in the 70s and early 80s, Europe came out and said some really clear, sent some clear messages about the PLO being the representative the of the people for example. that they accepted. The, you remember, your father remembers probably mm -hmm. that the right to self-determination for yeah. Palestinians and Palestinian status. So they changed the discourse. At the time. Something happened to Europe gradually, uh, particularly through the, the uh, Atlantic Alliance, the Transatlantic Alliance with the US, and with the fact that they accepted a role that is, you know, funding the occupation or nation building rather than playing a political role. And they left the US, they gave the US the monopoly over the political decision making. So Gradually, this is what happened. Europe was supposed to, you know, sign the checks, pay the bills, build institutions, help the Palestinians become, you know, democratic and so on. And uh, they didn't want to work at cross purposes with the Americans, and the Americans had the political uh, monopoly. And particularly you know, since we... Oslo. Huh? Particularly since Oslo is. Since was... Oslo, and yeah, and before even, but yeah, since Oslo, but still, there was a sense of lack of self confidence. Uh, lack of capability and agency among the Europeans themselves. And they keep saying, we are not united. We are not one voice. I said, somehow you can act, you can overcome that when it comes to other issues. Somehow when it comes to Ukraine or Russia or when it comes to other places, uh, you can move quickly and, and uh, regardless of your disagreements. But when it comes to Palestine, no. But what came, what became very apparent, Maureen, is that Europe is in many ways the ideological historical parent of Israel because Israel is a, a creation of a European colonial system and therefore and it is white colonialism in many ways that set up Israel in Palestine mm -hmm. <laughs> and the way in which Israel uses the uh, administrative laws, the, the uh, British mandatory laws and so on, and its relationship with Europe very clearly now uh, have, have come out openly as uh, uh, a colonial extension. Mm -hmm. And therefore, this, as part of the colonial legacy in the region, and as the parent, I don't want to go back to Balfour and everything else, but in terms of the relationship and ongoing relationship with Europe and the sense that Israel sees itself as a European country. 
uh, somehow mislocated in the Middle East, but it really not is not stuck in Asia. Mm. Yeah, yeah, not part of those, you know, uh, backward, uh, vile, uh, violent people, you know, called the Arabs and so on, and the Muslims. So within this, you have this special relationship. And you have the very, very strong legacy of guilt over the horror of the Holocaust. That is certainly a European issue and not a Palestinian issue or an Arab issue, even though they're trying to superimpose it on us as if we are anti semites or we hate the Jews. I said, look, our occupiers can be Buddhists and we're not going to love them. So <laughs> you don't like the occupation. We have nothing against Jews. We have something against oppression, occupation, and dispossession. That's the problem. So by linking Judaism to Zionism and by claiming to speak on behalf of all Jews, they rendered any uh, criticism of Israel as being anti-Jewish and anti-Semitic. This became very clear because Netanyahu is the architect or the formulator of this discourse, that mm -hmm. any criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. And, and, and if I may interrupt you, you'll, you'll remember this one statement he made that Hitler hadn't really considered the Holocaust until it was whispered <laughs> into his ear by Hajamin al Hussein. Uh, Hajamin, yeah, I mean, that was the, I don't want to say from the sublime to the ridiculous, that was absolutely absurd and ridiculous. So, yeah, I mean, as, if, as if Hitler didn't have his agenda, he waited for one Palestinian, you know, to tell him what to do. And he wanted to find a link. And the IHRA, the IRA, uh, uh, philosophy, if you will, is a forced attempt at uh, formulating this criticism of Israel being anti-Semitism and creating a whole <coughs> system that can be even translated into a legal, into a legislative uh, uh, subset mm -hmm. that would uh, criminalize uh, criticism of Israel and would create uh, a sense of labeling of people and therefore intimidating people should they, uh, we don't want to go into that but europe was the first to adopt the ira uh, uh, equating criticism of israel with anti-semitism in the same way as they accepted criminalizing bds and right. therefore right. Present, uh, preventing palestinians and preventing our allies from even exercising their rights their democratic rights to be moral and ethical consumers and uh, investors so europe gradually moved into that, the, the colonial past, the guilt over the uh, Holocaust and anti-Semitism, but also uh, you have uh, self-interest there, in addition to their alliance with the US <laughs> that went through a period of disruption, but they, even under Trump, they did not stand up to Trump when he was bashing the Palestinians relentlessly. Uh, and, and they, they refused, they, they didn't see the Palestinian cause as something that they can stand up for and stand up to the Americans mm -hmm. against that, but uh, ultimately their own self-interest within Israel. Israel is a major source of intelligence, of information, of weapons, tried and tested on Palestinians, of security systems. I mean, look in the Arab world, Mm -hmm. They're buying Israeli security systems, Israeli weapons, and they've been cooperating on intelligence for a long time with the UAE. It came out into the open recently, but it's been uh, ongoing. So Israel has positioned itself as a major espionage center, and with, of course, this very generous American funding as a, a major uh, weapons exporter, and uh, at the same time, uh, creating a, a network of, uh, under Netanyahu, it became very clear, of <laughs> extremely uh, dictatorial and uh, uh, oppressive systems that came out into the open. Now, whenever we talk to Europeans about the association agreements, about the neighborhood agreements, about Horizon 2020, about all the legislation, they will not apply their own legislation and their own uh, uh, requirements for cooperation to Israel. Uh, you know that more than I do. All the requirements, all the- About the excluding occupied territories uh, or Israeli institutions active in the occupied territories from yeah. benefiting from cooperation agreements with the European Union. 
uh, exactly, but that, the, the question is, even when they reluctantly it took, we started talking about labeling mm. in, uh, in the 80s, in the 1980s. And the conversation yeah. still continues. When the Europeans about labeling settlement products, all you need to do is label them so that people will know. And then we said, you can't just label them, you shouldn't import them because you are aiding and abetting a crime and settlements are a war crime and, and so on. Until now, even when they took a decision about labeling, they made it optional, they didn't pursue it, and they didn't implement it. And whenever a single country like Ireland, for example, starts talking about not importing settlement products, and, and as you know, the Senate took that decision, uh, the, the Europeans were, were against it. <laughs> and so the Europeans, in, in addition to their self-interest, in addition to their legacy of the past, in addition to anti-Semitism and their colonial, it, it's their colonial baby, <laughs> Israel. You cannot expect them to stand up to the US and to Israel and to implement legislation and international law and to, to help Palestine. But they do, they do fund. Now they stop the funding. Gradually, they've been stopping the funding. They're the ones who kept pushing for elections. We said, why don't you then get Israel to enable the Palestinians to have uh, free and fair elections, uh, freedom of movement, and so on, particularly in Jerusalem? They said, only with the decree can we do that. So they pushed and pushed, and we told the president, you have to have the decree so the Europeans can move. So the president issued the decree, the Europeans sat back. We said, where are you? You promised. <laughs> you, but, you but need when it comes to scrutinizing Palestinian actions, they tend to be a little more active and thorough. Oh. I mean, you've written, for example, recently about the the issue of, of school textbooks. Yeah, yeah, there have been lots of studies comparing Palestinian textbooks and Israeli textbooks. The problem is they've adopted, I think implicitly, I don't know if it's explicit, but somehow they've internalized the mentality that the only good Palestinian is a Zionist. It's the same thing the Israelis want us to accept the Jewish state. That's the only way they will talk to us because if we all become Zionists, then we are good people. Uh, then we are worthy of any consideration. The Europeans seem to think that way too, because the, the conditions that were placed on Palestinian textbooks are, are impossible conditions, that we want to lie to our children, that we want to adopt the Zionist Israeli version of history. We cannot even show a map of pre-48 Palestine. We cannot, we cannot talk about the conflict because that would be anti-Semitic, because that would be teaching our children to hate. We don't teach our children to hate. Israel provokes our children and traumatizes the whole people beyond endurance. When you blow up their homes and you kill whole families and so on, how can you tell them these are our good neighbors? And, and they want us to somehow create a version of reality that is consistent with what the Israelis want. Deny our history, deny our culture, deny our reality. You have to lie to your children. And if you mention in any way something that has been, you know, done to you as, as a people under occupation, which is the reality, then you are not teaching your children how to love and so on. Well, yet, the textbooks of the Israeli schools are horrible. They are much worse. And it's not just the textbooks. It's that you have the army giving the children their weapons and so on to look at them, to get used to them. You have children talking about how they want to kill Palestinians, they want to kill the Arabs, with, you know, as though it is natural. All public opinion polls show that the, every generation in Israel is more and more racist. And openly they talk about how the Arabs have to be expelled and they don't deserve to live and they don't have equal rights. And so they've created a culture of hate and racism and they don't react, they kill with impunity. And we don't see this horror that we see should they discuss. You know what, one thing, this, this organization, I forgot its name, Impact or something. It's, it's an Israeli organization that generally mm -hmm. sends over this propaganda and, Israel, and, and the Europe picks it up. Hmm? And geo-monitor. We, have, we, have, we, uh, we teach hate because 
imagine in one of our history books, we mentioned Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. We want to expurgate, we want to remove him from history, you know, <laughs> Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi shouldn't exist or didn't exist, you know. Maybe we shouldn't talk about the Crusaders. Maybe we shouldn't talk about, you know, how many uh, uh, massacres Israelis uh, did in, in the, the history of the creation of Israel on Palestine. So they want to, to censor our textbooks and to make us adopt willy-nilly the Israeli version because they have very sensitive sensibilities. We have to be very careful not to upset them to the point of, creating a forgery of our history our, and even our reality. Otherwise we'll be teaching hate, but the actual policies of Israel are acts of supreme provocation and incitement, and yet they are not even being looked at, let alone textbooks and things like that. So the issue of accountability is important and the issue of having, I keep telling you, they need to develop a backbone to stand up to Israel. And Israel needs to know that there is a price to be paid that they cannot continue with it with full impunity and not only that but being rewarded and palestinians being pressured blackmailed and so on now we're not going to get much funding from the europeans okay some people say why not but the issue is we are under occupation if you don't deal with this occupation if you don't deal with the settler colonial system if you don't deal with, with this apartheid uh, repressive system then whatever you do is not going to produce any results. It, it's a black hole because Israel can destroy whatever you build and they've been doing this. Dr. Ashrawi, I'd, I'd finally like to um, turn to uh, a separate issue, which is, well, it's a related issue very much actually. Um, you now have a new government in Israel you have a new administration in Washington that's um, uh, been, been in, um, that's been in power for about six months. And from what we've seen so far, you have the Biden administration more or less retaining the most consequential decisions uh, made by the Trump administration and the Bennett government more or less continuing very much uh, with the policies of, uh, of the Netanyahu government, although you know it, it, it does include one of, one of the Arab parties. Um, some turning specifically to the Bennett government, um, some people have said, you know, that um, many people will give it a pass because they found Netanyahu so repulsive and are glad to see anyone else in power. Um, other people say, actually, this could present an opportunity because it's a weak and fragile government and more susceptible to um, external pressure. And other people also, they look at the Biden administration and they say, well, the, well, the U.S. government itself may be continue, continuing with similar policies. There is a change in the general political environment in Washington. And I was curious um, um, how, how you look at, at this uh, situation in terms of yeah. the changes that we've seen in 2021 so far. Yeah, actually for the last 12 years, as you know, uh, Netanyahu has been taking and his coalition and the right wing in Israel, the racist right wing in Israel, have been taking the whole political discourse to the right. The whole terrain has been shifting to the right and to the extreme right and to the racist right and to the violent right, to the point where they created, they normalized a culture of hate and violence and oppression. And the, the so-called peace camp and the left wing and, and the progressives and so on were weakened and excluded, not only marginalized sometimes in order to just rescue themselves to survive, they started repeating some of the discourse of the Zionist right, frankly speaking, in order to survive. The Palestinian issue was removed because that's something you can deal with through violence and suppression and oppression and you know, bombing Gaza, killing a few thousand here and there, maintaining, building more settlements, nobody's going to stop us in the West Bank, unleashing settler violence on the Palestinians, uh, carrying out ethnic cleansing from Jerusalem and different places. And they're getting away with it till it became a fact of life to them and a sense of entitlement. So a change in government after these, not just 12 years, but even before, it's been a process, as you know. 
is not going to change the mentality or the culture or the laws because there's a whole set of discriminatory laws beginning with the nation state law that is so blatantly racist when they talk about only Jews have the right to self-determination in Eretz Israel, which is all of Palestine. <laughs> so it is uh, legalized apartheid and, and discrimination. So, and a whole set of laws, the last of which is, was discussed more recently on the issue of uh, family <laughs> reunification, not even pertaining to us Palestinians in the West Bank that they, and Jerusalem and so on, they refuse family reunification for us completely because they don't want Palestinians from outside to come or those who marry Palestinians here to live together. But this specifically refers to uh, Palestinians in Israel, 48 Palestinians who marry Palestinians from the West Bank uh, and Gaza cannot bring their spouses to live with them in Israel. So we are the only group <laughs> that are forbidden to fall in love uh, with each other <laughs> or to live with each other or to have families living together should you happen to be a Palestinian with an Israeli passport or a Palestinian under Israeli direct occupation. So that, that is being discussed now. This is this government. Now this government contains within it uh, all the legacy of Netanyahu. People were, I mean, the only thing they have in common is the fact that it is not Netanyahu. The, the intense hatred and resentment and, uh, you know, the total rejection of Netanyahu as a person even, because many of these were his friends and his assistants and so on. Uh, and they are now taking their revenge. So Bennett was working with him. Lieberman was working with him. Gideon Saar was working with him. These are people that uh, did not see anything wrong with Netanyahu's policies. They just resent him personally. <laughs> and the fact that this is such a weird coalition, when you have merits and the remnants, let's say, of merits and labor and so on, and the irony of irony is you have the uh, united uh, list, the, the, the Islamic party in Israel joining this uh, government. Uh, it's such a weird creature. Now, Bennett is trying to prove that he can be just as brutal, as cruel, and as right-wing as Netanyahu. Hmm? Because Netanyahu is accusing him of being, of forming a left-wing government. Imagine, he's calling this government that has Bennett and Lieberman and Gidon Saar and, and uh, uh, Lapid as being a left-wing socialist government. Right? He borrows the language of Trump uh, very openly. And uh, so uh, for the first two years, if they last, it's a dysfunctional system anyway. Uh, the, there was no government that could last for a long time, as you know, for an well, election that's that's probably <laughs> coming uh, too much of a good thing, maybe. But anyway, uh, the, the, uh, this dysfunctional system, the only way it survives is by being brutal to the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Is by it's, showing it's that common they, denominator. Yeah, yeah, that's it. We yeah. can be strong. We can uh, build more settlements. We can destroy. We can threaten Gaza. Don't you dare do this or do that. And we will uh, use even uh, more violence against you. And and the, the, again, the ethnic cleansing of Jerusalem and all these things are happening mm -hmm. and they are escalating. And Bennett is trying to live up or live down to his reputation as being, you know, the head of Yesha. You know, Yesha is a settler organization. So, uh, and he is uh, the, a great supporter of settlement. And uh, just a couple of days ago, they, uh, they approved permits for more settlement, uh, settler units. So that, that's one thing. So we, the West in many ways, gave a sigh of relief that it's not Netanyahu. The anybody but Netanyahu approach, <laughs> in a sense, made them give a pass to a government that is going to be even more destructive. Maureen, historically, any party or parties that join a government led by the right wing becomes a front for the right. And that's when, what we're seeing now. When Labour joined Likud, remember, they had Paris as foreign minister, and they had Barak yeah. as Minister of Defense. Yeah. And what happened? Labor tried to give fascism a civilized face and tried to defend Netanyahu and his policies. 
and Barak is the one who carried out the first attacks on Gaza mm -hmm. and you know was engaged in war crimes and both were labor but they served Likud and they served Likud policies so this is what happens normally and now uh, the, the weaker parties probably to stay in the coalition there's a mutual interest they don't want to leave because they're disappearing and they need to be part of the government and they need to expand their base. And of course, the larger parties need the smaller allies in order to stay in power. So it's a sense of mutual blackmail and mutual interest. But Dr. As we... Hanan, Dr. Hanan uh, I, I want to thank you very much for taking the time uh, um, to join us and for this extremely informative um, uh, discussion. And to thank you once again for uh, joining us on uh, on Connections. Oh, <laughs> thank you. It's my pleasure, even though we didn't talk about the American scene, but that's something you I, I really look forward than... uh, to inviting you uh, back uh, to, to discuss that. Uh, and the conversation continues. I look forward to it. Thank you very oh, okay. much. Thank you, Mike. It's good to be with you.